Can everybody hear me up there? We're good? All right. So last time we talked about the Turing test. Uh, we said it's a test. It's very practical. It tries to uh, identify intelligence. Uh, it's hard to define intelligence, but it's easy to define a test that certain entities can pass or not pass, a test that can implement, and that's what the Turing test is. And so we mentioned that certain things cannot pass the Turing test, other things can, and we resort to science fiction characters because we don't have real good life examples yet. We're kind of on the cusp of that. And uh, the big question is whether the machines that we have today, or machines like them in the near future, will be able to pass the Turing test. By machines, we really mean algorithms, because there's nothing special about the machines. Right? We already said that there's computational universality, there's lots of computation models, they're all equivalent to one another, each one can simulate each other effectively and efficiently. So um, we're kind of on the cusp of being able to create algorithms that can mimic arbitrary intelligence that's indistinguishable from human intelligence. Um, we mentioned criticisms of the Turing test. It's a very functional test, it's behavioral, it compares it to humans, it's not objective, it's comparative. And we mentioned a Chinese room uh, objection, which means uh, if there's a thing that can pass a Turing test and you replace a computer by a human that doesn't understand the language conversed, but the human still executes the code one line at a time, the whole room would appear intelligent to the outside. But inside, you can debate whether there's anything really intelligent going on, even though it behaves intelligently. So it leaves questions about whether the appearance of intelligence is the same as intelligence, and whether there's such things as soul and consciousness and sentience and self-awareness and what do they mean, it's not nothing because everything we do, everything, you know, everything we live by revolves around such questions, right? Agency and free will and rights and privileges and, um, you know, uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's tricky business. It raises a lot of interesting psychological, philosophical, you know, um, even, even legal questions, right? You know, if, if there's a machine or an algorithm or a computer that's intelligent enough, maybe it would insist on having certain rights, legal rights and uh, re legal privileges, and you know, who are we to deny it that in the long run if it can behave just like us or even surpass us in many ways, right? So there's legal issues too that will eventually have to be um, addressed. Uh, even now, there's, there's kind of moral and legal issues and philosophical issues. How many heard about the, the trolley problem? The trolley problem? Self-driving cars have to start solving, you know, or at least implementing some solutions to the trolley problem. When, when a, when a self-driving um, car is about to have a collision, and by about to have a collision, I mean the collision is a second and a half away, which to humans seems, you know, immediately imminent, but to a computer, that's a lifetime worth of calculations. A computer can do billions of calculations trillions of calculations even, if, if there's a GPU on board, and it can take its sweet time and decide what to do next, whether to run down the person that's right in front of it, or ram into the car that's right in front of it, or veer off to the side and maybe kill a couple of pedestrians on the side, um, and it can get very nuanced, right? Not just by numbers, should it just ram into one that's right in front of it, or veer off to the side and you know, maybe ram into two, uh, or vice versa, try to save two in favor of one. But what if you could look up the medical records of these people in the next you know, tenth of a second, because it could be all you know, available on the web, and realize that the, you know, the, 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 the one person uh, that's in front of it is, is, is a young you know, teenager, healthy young teenager, but the two people on the sidewalk are very elderly and they're, you know, maybe have terminal cancer, and they're about, they're about to die in three months anyway, you know, from the medical diagnosis. What do you do then? You know, the numbers can be you know, negated by such other considerations. Very tricky business. Even reasonable people you know, have a hard time agreeing on exactly the right course of action. And even if you say, well, don't do anything, just let you know, luck run its course, that's a decision too. Luck, even by ignoring what to do and just let it happen the way it used to be, that's an algorithm. You just implemented luck as an algorithm or randomness. And that's not necessarily great. Um, and, and you still have responsibility because you could have done something else and you chose not to uh, algorithmically. So whatever you do is on you, or whatever you don't do, that's on you too. By you, I mean you know, the designer, the programmer, the creator of these technologies, the users of these technologies, and so on. So it's tricky business. Um, we talked about a reverse Turing test uh, where you try to convince the computer that you're not a bot, 
We mentioned a CAPTCHA is such a thing. Most of you have used CAPTCHA as websites, right, to prevent bots from coming in and creating bogus accounts and so on. Um, and we mentioned Frankenstein being the first kind of r robot story. The robot was kind of uh, organic rather than, than synthetic, but uh, still uh, there were many iterations of that. HAL 9000, 2001 Space Odyssey, that's a, that's a Frankenstein story. So is Terminator and many other movies. And we went through rapid succession through a bunch of movies. Actually, I've seen most of these, but um, I wonder if, if any of you recognize some of these. Uh, this one, you probably recognize, right? It's the old version of the new series on Netflix. Roby the Robot, uh, Lost in Space. Does that sound familiar at all? Okay. Maybe I'm dating myself here, but that, that was a pretty good show. There's a new rendition on Netflix just came out, so it's actually new as well as old. Um, we mentioned uh, uh, movies like Tron. Uh, which movie is this, by the way? Hacker's favorite. Anybody recognize that? Yeah. War Games, yeah, the Whopper. Um, of course, Robocop, again, another robot story. Sentience, uh, artificial sentience, self-awareness. Um, the Terminator stories kind of took a dark turn, and, uh, but, but the old fear is nothing new. You know, Frankenstein, 2000, you know, 200 years ago, had the same motif. You know, you create something that turns on you, there's unintended consequences, kind of a mad scientist kind of uh, characters that uh, create technology without considering all the consequences and you know you can have a very dark outcome uh, if you're not careful. Uh, this is the old West world, not the new one. The new one is very, very uh, subtle and nuanced. The, the old, old one was pretty good too. Michael uh, Crichton, uh, Crichton cr created that, uh, the author of Jurassic Park. Back in the mid-70s, that's Yul Brynner starring as the, the man in black. Uh, uh, those fans of the show. They, the, of course, movies back then weren't that deep. Character developments weren't as sophisticated. Storytelling wasn't as evolved as it is today. Audiences weren't as aware as they are today. Uh, but still, those were pretty good movies. Uh, Logan's Run, there was a robot there called Box that would cryogenically freeze humans uh, for food. Uh, how many recognize this? Which, which show was this on TV? Long time ago, late 70s, early 80s, maybe early 80s. The glory days, the 80s. Anybody recognize this? N nobody? Not even as a nostalgic fandom kind of a retro homage. Uh, Knight Rider, right? right the, the driving car, self-driving car. And, uh, you know, this guy would solve crimes and help people with this robot car. Well, you know, it's, uh, not, now we got the Tesla. So it's, it's only, you know, 35 years later. Uh, so. Um, we mentioned, uh, you know, the replicants of Blade Runner, uh, more sophisticated movies like, like Blade Runner and AI. Uh, of course, there's giant robots like the Transformers and the Matrix, Agent Smith. This is kind of an obscure movie. It just came out about a decade ago. Anybody recognizes this? Angelina Jolie starred in it. No? Any science fiction fans in the audience? Uh, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, Will Smith and I, Robot. Uh, this is a takeoff on the Asimov story, iRobot, um, but uh, you know, the, the, the original Asimov robot stories were much better than these movies, very sophisticated storytelling. Uh, they, they were kind of algorithmic storytelling. Based on the three laws of robotics, the characters would interact with the robots, the humans, and you'd have a whole plot unfolding with unintended consequences, and that was pretty cool. Uh, and uh, there's more humorous kind of depictions of robots, Jaime the Robot and Get Smart, and, the Tin Man, Wizard of Oz, I consider that to be kind of a robotic character. Uh, your mileage may vary. And uh, Futurama, we mentioned Bicentennial, Bicentennial Man. There's a lot of depictions of self-aware, you know, synthetic organisms, robots, AIs in movies and very interesting and very different scenarios. Some are very positive and uh, genteel. Others are dark and hostile and, and everything in between. Um, and then... Uh, Isaac Asimov uh, pioneered this whole, this whole area back in the 40s, before computers really existed. And we mentioned the laws of robotics. You know, a robot may not injure a human or, through inaction, allow humans to come to harm. That's the first law. The second law, a robot must obey human orders unless it conflicts with the first law. The third law is a robot must protect itself unless it conflicts with either the first or the second law. So this is essentially uh, like uh, assertional programming, like prologue-type, you know, uh, programming, 
And uh, this was before programming existed in, in, in the real world. And, and he you know, conducted his uh, um, uh, characters and plot lines according to these laws, and it was just fascinating. If you haven't read Asimov, you, I, I strongly encourage you to. And then, uh, of course, he also invented the word robotics. That's, that's, that's his, he coined that, that word. Um, and it's based on logic programming, basically. And then later, uh, somebody added a, a ro uh, rule number zero that precedes rule number one. A robot may not harm humanity, either by action or inaction, allow humanity to come to harm. That precedes law number one. Uh, so in case you need to sacrifice a human being to save all of humanity or a very large number of human beings, that supersedes as a, as a goal. Essentially, that's a trolley problem right there, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Uh, who, who said that? Mr. Spock, of course. Which movie? The Wrath of Khan. Yeah, hey, we got a Trekkie in the audience. Great. Um, so, uh, again, this, this happened you know, in the 1940s through Asimov, this kind of awareness and analysis and reflection. Later, we uh, even erased the first uh, Law, the zeroth law about humanity and talked about general sentience. One should not harm sentient being. Because if you talk about only humans, that's, that's kind of biased if you think about it. Um, right? If you discriminate against individuals based on gender, you're sexist. If you, in, you know, discriminate against individuals based on race, you're racist. If you in, discriminate against individuals based on species, you're a speciesist. How many heard the term speciesist? It's not used very often because we're all engaged in this bias collectively, and none of us complain because we're all in, a, in that same boat. We complain about these other biases that are more specific. Anyway, something to think about. But I digress. Uh, this is how, now. Now we're going into reality. So we're living science fiction. This is science fact. These are early robots that can move around the battlefield that had explosives on board that were programmed to go somewhere and then detonate. Uh, can anybody place the, the, the historical uh, time window? What, what year do you think this happened in? Let's just look at this picture. Right? What, what, what year was this picture taken in, roughly? What decade are we talking about? It's World War I. It's not World War II. Even if it was World War II, it would be pretty amazing that you'd have robots crawling around the battlefield. This is World War I. This is you know, 1915. This is more than a century ago. We already had primitive robots. Today, they look like this. Uh, they're sophisticated. They've uh, got AI on board. They've got uh, solar panels to recharge. They've got all sorts of sensors and cameras and pattern recognitions, and they're fully programmable, and they're fully autonomous, and they can be programmed to do arbitrary things, and they do. They roam around the battlefields of the world. And, uh, you know, talk about killer apps. They come in all flavors. They're, they're all heavily armed. Some have machine guns, others have missiles, armor-piercing um, uh, projectiles. Some are wheeled, others are tracked. Uh, some can move 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, you know, really, really fast. Uh, some kind of crawl along. Um, and um, many of these, there's still a human in the loop that controls the fire, no fire decision. You know, it's about to kill something or somebody or you know, destroy some vehicle or plane, a human kind of t tends to kind of be in the loop and, and give the green light. But it's not necessary from a technological point of view. They can be completely autonomous, except that politically, legally, morally, you still probably want a person to just give the go ahead in case it's a court martial or big political debacle. You know, somebody can point to the human and say it's that guy's fault, as opposed to who knows whose fault it was. Uh, but it's, it's beginning to be not necessary at all. Um, and in the sky, you have planes that are fully autonomous now. Uh, they can loiter for days or weeks. There's, there's solar-powered planes that can loiter forever, basically. They never need to land. They have uh, solar panels over the wings. And during the day, they slowly rise. And they get to 60, 70,000 feet. During, a, during night, they switch to the batteries. When the batteries are fully charged by the solar cells during the day, they begin to glide down. And as they glide down, they convert the kinetic energy, the potential energy to kinetic energy. And then during the day, they glide up again. So their flight path is a zigzag you know, by height. And they can literally be airborne for months or, or even years. They're kind of solid state, except for the um, motor for the propellers. Um, there's, there's one of them right now, right here in this uh, picture. 
Uh, some are jet powered, they're, they're, they fly hypersonically. Uh, there's one releasing a smart bomb. Uh, some of them Hellfire missiles can take out tanks. Uh, and again, there's all sorts of advantages of having robotic planes in the sky. This again, I remind you, this is not science fiction. These are products, these have been in the sky for, for more than a decade now, this is not something new. Um, many advantages about pilotless planes. First of all, you don't have a human in the loop. Nobody, you know, can, can you know, your, your pilot doesn't get killed or hurt or uh, get captured by the enemy and put through some, uh, you know, political kangaroo trial and made to sign some bogus confession on that international TV and create a political embarrassment for you, none of that. Uh, secondly, since there's no human on board, uh, all that weight of the human and life support for the human and the oxygen tanks and the survival equipment and the ejection seat, completely unnecessary. You can replace those with payload. Payload can be more bombs or it could be you know, useful things like sensors and more computers and uh, other things. Um, another advantage, uh, a fighter plane um, in dogfights, if there's a human on board, its performance is restricted by the uh, capabilities of the human. Uh, a human can only take about 10 to 12 Gs before passing out. If a human takes 15 Gs, maybe for two seconds, they're probably dead. Um, these planes, some of them, they can take 30 or 40 G turns. Something that would, for sure, will kill a human. Uh, and these things can outmaneuver any plane with a human inside. Human, the human, human, uh, human, human planes, human piloted planes have no chance against these things in, in dogfights and aerial maneuvers and so on. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. He's saying, what, what's a robot? Uh, well, there's very, varying degrees of automation. He's asking, is, a, is an automatic toaster a robot? Well, it's a very primitive one. You know, any machine is you know, a mechanism to do stuff. And it doesn't have to be electronic. It could be a mechanical kind of machine. It could be of some sort of a loom. You know, the, the, the original looms that weave the cloths, you know, instead of pe people doing it by hand with needle, you know, were much more efficient than humans by orders of magnitude. And, you know, in some sense, it's a robotic device. It's very limited in scope. All it can do is weave cloth. It couldn't do other things. But, uh, ro you know, uh, me mechanical or electronic or automated devices get more and more sophisticated. So where you draw the line is, is kind of um, fuzzy and somewhat arbitrary. Um, but when I say robot, I mean something significantly sophisticated. Something that, you know, you look at it and look at what it does and you go, wow. You know, it's not something that you go, oh, well, yeah, of course, you know, uh, a mechanical loom. Uh, but, uh, you know, something like a Roomba in your house, that's a robot. Does it have to, like, move around and do something quickly? Or is it the computer that gives us software uh, robot? Well, so it's an AI of sorts, right? It's just uh, like HAL 9000 it was an AI in, in that movie. And you know, programs that we have today that can beat arbitrary humans at jeopardy, they're, they're kind of AI-ish. Uh, but they don't, necessarily, um, they don't necessarily have agency in the real world. They don't necessarily move things around and have bipeds that uh, do things on their behest. But they can easily be, be wired to do that, simply with a simple Bluetooth connection or something. It can order some robot around and it has appendages and so on. Uh, Dean came and created. Uh, a mechanical, or a, a electronic wheelchair that, that was robotic. And that wheelchair has four wheels and it can get up on two wheels. How many have seen that? It can go upstairs, up a flight of stairs, a wheelchair. Balancing up, it was a precursor to the, uh, uh, to the Segway. The Segway was a spin-off of that. Uh, when you ask paraplegics, what's the worst thing about being wheelchair bound? You know, most able people will say, you know, oh, it's not being able to walk or move or play soccer or go upstairs or whatever. And no, the, the worst thing they say is to have to look up at everybody in the world all the time like they're children. You know, interestingly enough, it's psychological. You know, so when you sit there, you constantly have to look up at people, people look down at you, it gets to them after a few years or a decade. You know, it's, it's, that's what they hate the most, actually. Um, so that, that wheelchair has solved that problem. It's a, it's a, it's a full-out robotic device. Uh, it can do arbitrary maneuvers, it can be programmed, it can self-balance, and so on. Um, so the line of what is a robot, what is, is, is a fuzzy one, right? Um, so is the line of what is a human being, actually. It's kind of fuzzy, too. Some people are paraplegic. You know, they can't move their arms and legs completely mobile. 
And some can't even talk or see or hear, but their mind is in there working. And, and we have trouble even being sure of that. You know, some people argue whether you know, it's, a, it's a real person, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fully you know, human person, or somebody just needs to pull the plug on this thing. You know, even their family sometimes say, you know, pull the plug, it's not really a person anymore. But it's a very fuzzy line, both legally, morally, ethically, practically, and, and the ability to measure that thing. Some people are actually trapped in their own bodies. They can't move a muscle, but their mind is still working. That's a terrible, how many heard of this condition? It's, it's horrible. Um, they can feel and hear stuff, but they cannot not respond whatsoever by, by any means at all. Uh, that, you know, is that really a person? You can say, yeah, but you know, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's arbitrarily fuzzy cases, even, even with, with, with humans. So certainly with machines, it's, uh, it's a whole spectrum. Um, but certain, certain AIs, you know, there's no questions. You know, they're, they're intelligent to, to whatever degree in whatever domain. And the question is, can we have a general AI that will be as able as us? And if, if there was such, such an AI, they will be able to create other versions of themselves simply because we do too, and it's doing like us. So he'll be able to create, or it will be able to create more versions of itself better versions of itself, and it could be a vicious cycle, and, or I should say a <coughs> virtuous cycle. It doesn't have to be vicious, that cycle. It could be a virtuous cycle leading to better and better AIs, you know, creating their next generation and so on. And it's also a little bit alarming because, you know, we can lose control of this process and it may leave us in the dust. But more, more on that a little bit later. Uh, so you have dirigibles, and uh, of course, you used to have these, these you know, clunky old copters that were pilotless, drone copters. Nowadays, you have really tiny copters uh, and uh, drones, and you can buy them at uh, you know, Toys R Us or, or on the web for just a few bucks, you know, 50 or $100 dollars will get you a very nice little drone with a camera that can also do some stuff autonomously as well as under human control. Uh, very sophisticated stuff. And some airborne robots are very tiny. They're the size of insects, right, like uh, fireflies or or uh, you know, dragonfly type um, robots, and, and, and th those two can be autonomous, and they have sensors on board, and they're usually bound by the battery life, because because they're so tiny, the battery's so small, they can fly for a few minutes or tens of minutes, you know, but not necessarily for hours. But, but batteries are getting better, so that's not necessarily a, a hard brick wall on, the, on this technology. Uh, and at sea, you have lots of robots. These boats were patrolling the Chinese waterways around the Chinese Olympics a few years ago, um, you know, autonomously and semi-autonomously, -auton looking for intruders and so on. And notice there's machine guns on board. You know, they weren't just kidding. Uh, whenever we have a new great autonomous platform, we always arm it with machine guns, bombs, torpedoes, or missiles. This is what we do. You know, it's, we can't help it. Uh, and um, some of them are submersibles, and those are great for looking for wrecks and you know shipwrecks on the bottom of the ocean and minerals and resources down there and they can loiter for long, long periods of time autonomously at great depths. Um, and of course we have self-driving cars. So ARPA was trying to create self-driving cars for decades, literally, and, and failed. They spent billions of dollars on it, uh, didn't succeed. So finally they had the wherewithal to crowdsource it. So in 2005 they put a $1 million bounty to anybody that can create a self-driving car that would drive through about 100 miles of desert successfully without crashing into boulders or falling off cliffs. How many of you heard of that, the, the DARPA challenge? And uh, several dozen teams entered, and none of them won. Uh, so DARPA, not to be um, thwarted, uh, doubled the money to $2 million the next year, and this time about six teams did win. And that's some of the entries that went in there. Some of them were big, you know, heavy tank-like vehicles that would crush other vehicles. Uh, I guess that's one way to get out of traffic jams. Um, others were, you know, lighter based on SUVs or Jeeps or sedans and, you know, they were full of sensors and lidars and radars and they looked pretty clunky, maybe were retrofitted. Uh, here's one based on a Humvee, uh, this was based on a station wagon, yeah, this is 2005, 2006, and uh, one was a motorcycle actually, it not only had to navigate autonomously, you know, through desert, but also keep itself balanced as it's going off-road on, on uneven ground. That's, that's, that's an even bigger challenge. That thing did pretty good. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that's 2005, you know, these touring machines. And uh, here we are just 
you know, 15, 16, 17 years later, past 2005, 2006, and, and now that's what they look like today. So, you know, they, over a period of only 10 years, they went from clunky old prototypes that, you know, were, were really kludgy uh, and not very able to, to, to people, you know, to, to nice, slick consumer products that, that we trust our lives to on the freeway. And, yeah, occasionally people died, but by the time I just said all this about these self-driving cars, probably a dozen other people died all over the world from car accidents from other than self-driving cars. Nobody's just going to write newspaper stories about that. So that's all. So when you hear somebody die in a Tesla or in a Nissan Leaf or one of those self-driving cars, or you know, yeah, of course, some, something will happen. People, people die in elevators, too. Yeah. But that doesn't stop you from going to elevators every single day without fearing for your life. You know, on average, these things save lives. They don't take lives. Um, when, um, when cars first came out in the 1870s, 1880s, you know, self, so just drug cars, just, you know, internal combustion engine cars, people said, oh, you know, cars are dangerous, they're reckless. Uh, you know, a horse and buggy is much safer. You know, a horse will never jump off a cliff. It's a sentient animal. It'll protect itself, and therefore it's, it's rider. Um, and a horse will never crash into a brick wall at high speed, so you're better off driving, you know, riding horses rather than cars. And people would refuse to get into cars. They thought these things go unnaturally fast, and they're just dangerous, and have no soul, you know, have no sentience. And uh, for a while, that's how it went. Um, and nowadays, of course, it's the other way around. Nobody thinks twice. I mean, you're all driving cars, owning cars, using cars every single day without constantly worried about, you know, uh, your life. And, you know, of course, you take precautions, too. You put on your seatbelts, and, you know, you don't go too fast. You obey the traffic rules and so on. And that's okay, and it's reasonably safe. And when occasionally somebody dies, you don't say, oh, well, you know, somebody just died in a car. We're going to ban all cars. We're going to go back to horses. You know, that, that's not the right reaction, you know. Right reaction is, well, then how do we make cars safer? How do we get people to not do reckless things and get drunk and drive and that kind of thing? And so uh, when, when planes first came out, it was the whole thing all over again. You know, when, when airplanes first came out and we started taking, you know, people around the skies, people said, oh, you know, cars is one thing, but to get to the sky, and that's unnatural. It's, you know, humans will never meant to fly, and, you know, it's, it's dangerous. And, of course, there were some plane crashes, and, and of course now you just get on a plane, go halfway around the world, pay your $300, and you know, wake up on another continent a few hours later, and you, know, you don't think it was that big of a deal. Um, so it takes time for, for technology to mature and people to accept it, and, and now people say all this new thi the same things about self-driving cars, but in 10 years nobody will think twice about it. In fact, in 10 years at some places, some countries in the world, uh, uh, humans will not be allowed to drive cars. You know, without a special super duper license and showing special needs or, or just as a very specific hobby or whatever. You know, it's generally robots will be doing all the driving because it's just much safer that way. So robotic drivers even right now are twice as safe as humans right this now, right this second, in terms of accidents per passenger mile. And it's going to about 10x more safety. About a million people a year die from car accidents. Every single year a million people die. Never mind the ones that get maimed or horribly burnt in a car, fiery car crash and things like that. Most of them can be saved. So, okay, we can talk again about that in 10 years, or you know, remember this talk in 10 years. Um, so in space, uh, we had robots for decades already. Space is a specialized environment. It's very hostile, very inhospitable to life, and also very far away to get to the moon and Mars and other planets. So you know, the Martian rovers were always robots because we, we can't safely put people on, on Mars yet. Technically speaking, we could. We we'll just can't get them back. Uh, can, so uh, you know, there's actually a lot of people who'd be willing to take a one-way trip to Mars. Um, that's, that's a different story by itself. But one day it'll be two-way trips, and Elon Musk is trying to make that happen. But Carl Sagan, pictured here, was one of the early proponents of uh, robotic space exploration. Um, factories already had robots for many decades. You know, most factories are very highly automated, and some are almost fully automated, almost don't require human intervention. Right? And here's some example of assembly lines. Cars are made mostly by robots. And these robotic arms you know, have been you know, deployed by the, the millions all over the planet across factories, and they produce most of the stuff that we, we consume, actually. And guess who makes these robotic arms? Themselves. <laughs> The, the, the robot arm factory has robot arms making robot arms. 
right? So, so that's an interesting example of self-replication. Um, in your house, you may have Roombas and other household appliances that can vacuum or mop or do other cool things around the house. I've, I've had Roombas since the early 2000s, so these are nothing new already. This is a 15-year-old technology. Now there's a very sophisticated, they, they, they will you know, Wi-Fi into your smartphone and tell you exactly where they vacuum, form a little map of where they've been, where they haven't been, how many times they covered the area, and, and so on. They can go on the furniture. Uh, big installations like hotels and convention centers have giant big Roombas the size of refrigerators because those need to you know, vacuum many, many dozens of acres of carpet and uh, not just a, a room or two. So there's different versions of autonomous kind of vacuums going on. Um, some companies have produced robotic pets. You know, the Sony Ibo uh, will go around. Uh, you know, it can bark. It can you know, play dead. It can fetch your slippers or whatever. Uh, so those little robots, household robots, are getting more and more sophisticated. Um, some are prototypes. Some are actual products. The, the Sony Ibo is a product. Um, and then uh, there's robots like the Asimo uh, by Honda. And that's the evolution of that product. It started as a clunky old biped, uh, very big, and now it became smaller, more sophisticated, more able. And today the uh, Asimo uh, by Honda can self-recharge. It can play soccer. It can fetch you some food, uh, you can do you know, pretty cute and clever things around the house. Uh, it's still kind of expensive and you know, it's limited. It can't do everything, obviously, but they're getting more and more sophisticated. Here's the uh, Asimo robot conducting a philharmonic orchestra. Uh, there's Yo-Yo Ma trying to kiss it after the fact, probably in admiration. Uh, it's actually very difficult to conduct an orchestra. You know, it's not just waving your arms around. You have to listen to the music and be in touch in tune with the musicians, and there's a lot of timing involved and subtlety, and it's very artful. So to have a robot do that is actually a very um, high-level cognitive task. And then there's wearable robots, uh, exoskeletons, right? So um, many of these are prototypes, but some are products. This one is a product. This exoskeleton you can wear, and it'll magnify your, your bodily strength by 5x. So you can lift things that are 100 or 150 or 200 pounds, and the battery will run for several hours, and you can buy it for $60,000, roughly. If you can't afford $60,000, you can rent it for $600 a month, which is you know, quite affordable. So you can have your own exoskeleton. Not quite Iron Man, but you know, it's halfway there. Uh, how many knew that? You, you, can, you, can, you can buy or rent exoskeletons right now. Okay, well, my gift to you. You, know, you can. Um, and there's ones that can fly. You know, essentially, they're like miniature, tiny little miniature planes that will take you to the sky or even allow you to swim real fast under the sea. It does an exoskeleton allowing a person to lift very heavy weights. Uh, soldiers can carry very heavy packs, 200, 300 pounds on their back, because it's the exoskeleton that's doing all the heavy lifting, not their spine. Um, and it's getting more and more sophisticated, these exoskeletons. For people who are this, you know, somewhat uh, less than fully abled, uh, these exoskeletons can help them walk upstairs, for example, where before they couldn't. Uh, or just walk, period, where before they were wheelchair bound. Now they're wearing these exoskeletons that can help them walk, you know, biped motion. Uh, they're not going to, you know, be able to dance ballet with high, uh, you know, finesse, but hey, you know, it, 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 then now they can walk and before they couldn't, that's a huge win, right? Uh, on the medical front, we have robots that do surgery. So this is a Da Vinci system. It costs a couple million dollars, a million and a half maybe, and hospitals use it to do surgery. So they can go with very, through very tiny incisions into the human body and do microsutures, microscopic sutures, where those suffice, and you don't need to open up the patient. If you were a, a human surgeon, you need to open up the patient, create a huge uh, concavity and you know, huge chance for infection and complications just to get at the you know, uh, site of the surgery inside the human body, these things can go in, so, so it's like laparoscopic surgery on steroids. You know, it's the robot that's controlling most of it. Of course, there's always humans in the loop that oversee, their doctors, their specialists, they oversee what's going on so it doesn't go haywire and crashes or does something horrible by mistake. Um, but uh, robots can do full surgery. Now, how many, how many knew that? Okay, so that's, that's pretty interesting. So here's some more pictures of that. Of course, there's always humans kind of loitering around making sure it's going okay, but the robot is doing all the heavy lifting and it can do tiny little sutures that are almost impossible to see, but you know, they connect the veins and the arteries in just the right way that a human can't even do even if they tried because humans have big clunky kind of mm, uh, gauche hands that, that are this big you know, and they can't do like micro tiny little 
uh, movements and sutures and uh, medical uh, incisions like, like robots can. Uh, so again, that's, that's been going on for more than a decade now. None of this is new. And it's getting more and more sophisticated all the time. So uh, this entire conference is on, on robotics and unmanned exhibit, you know, uh, vehicles and, and systems. Every single year, there's multiple venues like this. Some of them are very specialized. This is just underwater unmanned vehicles, specifically underwater ones, so submersibles, not even just vehicles or, or airplanes or other things. And in certain ways, reality has surpassed science fiction. So I'll give you a few examples. You know, Captain Kirk in the old Enterprise had this communicator. They'd flip open, and he would make a beep, and he would call the Enterprise, you know, beam me up, Scotty, kind of thing, 1966. Um, and then about 30 years later, 35 years later, Motorola came up with the uh, flip phone. And in fact, the reason it was a flip phone is because they're emulating Captain Kirk's little, you know, communicator. Um, and of course, fast forward a few more years, and now we have the iPhones, and the iPhones are much, much more sophisticated than, than even the science fiction depicted. You know, Cap you know the iPhone, uh, you can do a lot of things Captain Kirk couldn't do, even in the movies. He couldn't, you know, shop or have video conferences or surf, surf the web or, you know, tweet to his friends or uh, watch videos on that thing or, uh, or take pictures. With, you know, it was just a communicate. You know, the iPhone can do all these other things, too. And, and this, is, uh, this is reality. This is science fact, not science fiction. So, Again, cases where reality exceeded science fiction by many orders of magnitude, not just, a, not just caught up a little bit, but uh, by a huge uh, set of leaps and bounds. The Cray supercomputer, should you put it in perspective, the Cray 1 supercomputer of the 1970s, uh, comparing to the iPhone. So the Cray 1 is an 80 megahertz machine with 4 megabytes of RAM. And it costs $8 million and took 200 kilowatts to run. That's like as much power as an entire building, basically. The iPhone in terms of power per cost is almost 400,000 times better than a Cray-1 in terms of performance per cost um, yeah, ratio, including inflation. Even. Um, so uh, reality not just exceeded science fiction, but exceeded it by a lot in terms of these smartphones that you all have in your pockets. You're all carrying supercomputers in your pockets. In fact, you're carrying things in your pocket that are hundreds of thousands of times faster than a supercomputer was in the 1970s. Uh, other things were reality far surpassed science fiction. In the movie 2001 Space Odyssey, the HAL 9000 computer beat the astronauts in chess. At the time, it was almost laughable that that would be true. Uh, but then, about 30 years later, Deep Blue beat the world reigning uh, chess champion, Gary Kasparov, in chess in Tournament Rules International uh, Exhibition. And there's Kasparov looking very despondent as he's losing consistently to IBM Deep Blue. And that was 1997. This was 20 years ago. Um, and on the ELO chess scale, uh, a master, a chess master is considered to be 2,300 on the ELO chess scale. Only about 2% of tournament players are chess masters of 2,300 or above on this ELO scale of chess ratings. Grandmaster is 2,500. That's only 0.02%, only like 1% or 2% of 1% of, of chess players, tournament chess players, are grandmasters. Uh, super grandmaster is 2,700. There's only 3,000 of them in the world. And of course, the world champion, over 2,800, there's only four of them in the world, humans that can play 2,800 ELO scale uh, tournament chess. And Kasparov was 2,851. And today, who's the best chess player nowadays? Kasparov is long retired from chess. Yeah. Carlson, and uh, he's pretty young. He's probably still in his 20s, or late 20s maybe. And uh, he's also right up around that, that, that range. Uh, best human player ever was uh, Bobby Fischer, early 70s, about 2895, 2900. And uh, computers now play at 3340. Uh, no human has ever exceeded 3000. And this is kind of an exponential scale. You know, it's, uh, it's really amazing. Um, so, even your, even your smartphone can play grandmaster level chess with you, just out of your little iPhone. Uh, you don't even need a big uh, you know, cloud computer or anything fancy these days. Like uh, Deep Blue was like, a, like a, a cabinet full of computers all networked together, working in parallel. Now a smartphone can do the same. So chess uh, playing, you know, reality far exceeded the science fiction scenarios, which is kind of amazing, right? So we went from... Deep Blue beaming, you know, beating Gary Kasparov in 97 
And of course, there were movies and newspaper stories. There was actually a movie called Game Over. Uh, and Newsweek had a cover story called The Brain's Last Stand, you know, very dramatically, like humans are almost obsolete. Of course, that's, that's a great exaggeration, extrapolation from this uh, event. But uh, even more impressively, 2011, uh, AIs beat the world champions in Jeopardy. How many remember that? Just a few years ago. And Jeopardy is harder than chess in some sense because it involves a natural language understanding and parsing and you know, nat natural speech and construction of uh, sentences in whatever language you're using, English or, or any other language. It's a much more challenging problem, actually, than chess. Chess is very much more specific and myopic a problem, uh, you know, hard though it is already. So look at the scores here. I mean, uh, G Watson is beating them flat. You know, he's got a higher score than the rest put together. And he's a world champion Jeopardy player. Fast forward to just a year or two ago, 2016, and uh, Google's... Uh, um, Artificial uh, intelligence engine uh, AlphaGo beat the world champion in a game of Go. Uh, that just happened recently. And nobody thought that would happen for at least many decades, uh, simply because the game of Go is much more complicated than chess. The game tree is many, many orders of magnitude, like 100 orders of magnitude bigger than the, ga than the game tree of, of chess. Chess has maybe 10 to the 60, 10 to the 70 nodes in the, in the full out game tree expanded out where every node is a, is a board move, is a board position. Uh, Go has like 160, 170, uh, 10 to the 170, roughly, uh, board positions. And so it's, uh, the, the, the solution space is not just 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 or a billion times bigger. It's a Google times bigger, literally, than, than that of chess. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, there's um, you know, the world champion, uh, Lisa Dole, losing to uh, Google's AlphaGo in tournament play, that's actually one of the games they played, if you follow Go, and uh, you know, the, the pot was a million dollars, so this guy had a lot of incentive to win. Not only that, you know, he wanted to protect his world champion status, so he tried really hard, but only won one of five games, and only barely. Um, but not surprisingly, I mean, AI is getting more and more sophisticated, and uh, you know, we see the, this progression you know, very, very dramatically. Uh, so reality is catching up. Self-driving cars, we mentioned in movies in 2002, 2004, Will Smith and iRobot, the Minority Report, Tom Cruise had these self-driving cars. We already mentioned how he went from prototypes to, mo to, to consumer products you know, in just a few years, and reality is really catching up with science fiction there. They're almost on par now, and of course, soon they'll, they'll exceed the science fiction scenario when they start running implementations of the trolley problem and other things. Um, the Roomba, uh, we mentioned uh, household appliances, that's reality catching up with science fiction. So they're, they're still specialized. There's, like a, there's something called the luge uh, gutter cleaner, we clean their roof gutters. Uh, and so each machine around the house will, will specialize in particular types of cleaning. Right? You mentioned the smart toasters earlier. So a dishwasher is basically a robotic machine, you know, a robot that washes your dishes. Not very sophisticated, and that's all it can do. But soon there'll be a convergence of these things, just like in, in computers. And, um, these devices will begin to fold onto each other, and some devices will begin to do multiple tasks, just like your iPhone can do now multiple tasks. There's a great convergence, right? Your iPhone can do what you know, a dozen different machines had to do between them 20 years ago. You know, 20 years ago in the 90s or even early 2000s, if you want to listen to music, you'll turn on the stereo system. If you want to watch TV, you turn on your monitor, your TV. If you wanted to go shopping, you'd go to a store. You know, if you wanted to... Uh, talk to your friends, you'd pick up the phone you know, with a cord running into the wall. Uh, that was not long ago. Now, one machine can do all those things plus a lot more. That's your smartphone in your pocket. So there's a great convergence, and that's because of computational universality. We had a whole lecture talking about that a few, a few weeks ago. So same thing with robotics. More and more devices will converge into each other until you'll have kind of more general autonomous agents doing a great number of things. Right, so in the movie Terminator, the early Terminators, the T-105s and the T-100s looked like this. That was science fiction, James Cameron Terminator films. The later Terminators were more sophisticated, but today we have sort of, you know, basically these kind of Terminators running around the battlefield doing stuff. Uh, and by doing stuff, I mean <laughs> killing people. So um, in, uh, in the later Terminator movie, there was a, a Terminator that looked like a motorcycle. How many have seen these movies, by the way? I'm <coughs> presumptuous. Yeah, so one of them had a Terminator that looked like a motorcycle, a two-wheeled vehicle, and of course, we've already seen a two-wheeled autonomous vehicle uh, from, the, from the ARPA challenge, and that was 
you know, 13 years ago. So uh, you had these hunter killers, uh, you know, flying kind of drones, and now now you have all sorts of drones doing all sorts of things, uh, hovering around. Um, you know, usually it's military scenarios. Uh, usually these things are still expensive, but you have a lot of quad, you know, quadrocopters and drones that can take pictures and sense and. Uh, loiter around, then you can buy them at Toys R Us. So, so it went from prototype to expensive, cons you know, expensive military vehicle to consumer cheap device that you can buy at, at Toys R Us as a, as a, as a present. Um, and of course, you know, there were movies that showed autonomous AIs flying around, like the movie Stealth. There was one that uh, was able to land on aircraft carriers. Well, now we got that too. We got autonomous planes being able to land on aircraft carriers and fly supersonically and do all sorts of amazing things. Uh, Sigourney Weaver in uh, Aliens had this exoskeleton, it was called a power loader. How many have seen that movie? James Cameron before he did Terminator 2. Uh, so it was a wearable robot, it was an exoskeleton, and it was pretty cool in the movie. She used it to thwart the alien monster uh, at the end of the movie. And now we got exoskeletons, we've already seen a bunch of them. Uh, in the movies more famously lately, we have this very sophisticated exoskeleton, it's uh, Iron Man's suit. Uh, and now you can buy or rent it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a company called Cyberdyne, no joke, it's the same name as the one from Terminator, they did that on purpose. Uh, it weighs about 50 pounds, runs for five hours, 60,000 to buy, 600 a month to rent, 5x force amplification. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. So again, reality is catching up with, with the science fiction or you know, comic book scenarios very quickly. In Logan's Run, a movie with Michael New York and Farrah Fawcett Majors, how many have ever seen that? Mid, mid 70s, very nice movie. Uh, they're thinking about remaking it, like they do with all the great movies. Uh, and there was a robotic doctor there. There was a ro robot that basically operated on people and made them better. And of course, we just saw the Da Vinci system a few slides ago that does the same. And even kind of looks the same. It has all these kind of weird appendages and scalpels and multiple arms that do things. It's about a million and a half dollars, um, available for about a decade now. Ho lots of hospitals have that. <coughs> Um, Captain Kirk had this uh, cloaking device in one of the shows. He was trying to steal that from the Romulans. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But cloaking devices are now becoming reality too. Uh, Harry Potter, that one you know. He had a cloaking, a cloak, an invisibility cloak, that one you know. So uh, now we have invisibility cloaks. Uh, they're not quite, you know, zero visibility, but they're more like, you know, more like camouflage, very good camouflages. And we have cloaking devices that can route the light coming through around them and to all intents and purposes, somebody who's standing on this side of them will see the light sources if this object wasn't there. So the object will become invisible from a functional perspective. So there's literally cloaking devices being built right now, reality catching up with science fiction. And so we used to think you know, that only humans can do certain things and something sacrosanct about the ability to do this or that or the other. And now we're seeing that uh, Computers and robots and AIs can do more and more of what you thought we thought was strictly in the human domain. And this cartoon is very telling because this cartoon kind of makes light of this, of this trend. So here's, you know, messages. Only a human can review a movie. Only people have common sense. Only a human can translate, you know, language or speech. And more and more of these are crossed out and end up on the floor because they're no longer true because computers can now do that. And when this, when this uh, cartoon was drawn about 10 years ago, Look at what it said here, only humans can drive cars. And I added up, I added in this red X, this wasn't in the cartoon. So even as I drew up a cartoon and added it in, the cartoon was out of date already. And there's one more thing in the cartoon that humans now can do that computers can now do that we thought only humans can do earlier. And more and more of these things will, will fall on the floor over time and pretty quickly until there'd, there'd be not, not much left there. Um, so, so the question is where is this all going? You know, we're kind of on a cusp of, of you know, sentient AIs and you know, general kind of intelligence implemented as machines and software and algorithms. We see more and more of that and very quickly. So there's something called the singularity that was kind of pioneered by Stanislaw Ulam and John von Neumann in the 50s, but it was more popularized by Ray Kurzweil in the, in the 80s and 90s. And basically it says that if, when machines exceed humans in intelligence, uh, they'll start to do everything humans do, including constructing other AIs and better versions of themselves. And when they do that, uh, this, this bootstrapping process won't, not only, not only won't stop, it will accelerate. And at some point, they'll create better and better versions of themselves so much more quickly, because the better they are, the faster they can do this, that we'll be kind of left 
on the, on the sidelines as, as spectators. We're kind of watching with bewilderment this you know, vastly accelerating cycle of invention and reinvention. And, um, and we can only hope that it will lead to good things because we won't even understand what's going on, much less be able to intervene, intervene in it necessarily. So you know, it's, um, it's it, what they call it an intelligence explosion. right? And we're kind of on the cusp of that right now. Uh, Ray Kurzweil refers to it as the law of the accelerating returns, law of accelerating, accelerating returns. And of course, some people are alarmed by this, as well they should be. You know, it's not, you know, uh, whatever has great potential also could have great harm, uh, like you know, nuclear power and you know, versus nuclear weapons and other things like that. And so some people have called it the gray goo phenomena. Uh, if you see the day the Earth stood still with Keanu Reeves, the new version, there was this nanobots that kept self-replicating, and before you know it, the whole planet was in danger of becoming one big blob of gooey nanobots and nothing else, using everything on the planet as raw materials to create more nanobots, including us. You know, they treated us as raw materials, you know, not something that's pleasant for us to think about, but um, people worry about this, and they should be. Uh, so we all heard of Moore's Law, right? Exponential improvement in transistor nut counts, and exponential decrease in transistor sizes, and, but uh, there's Moore's laws all over the place. You know, this is, again, cur courtesy of K Ray Kurzweil. So uh, processor performance increases exponentially. These are all logarithmic scales. This is time going linear, and this is logarithmic imp exponential improvement in transistor count, in processor speed, in the price of transistors is, is dropping exponentially. Transistors used to be used to cost, like, you know, a few dollars per transistor, then a penny, then a tenth of a penny, and now you can buy a billion of them for, for, for just a few bucks, right? Packages and microprocessor. Uh, microprocessor cost per transistor cycle drops exponentially. So these are analogs of Moore's law. They're all exponential improvements, but they're not Moore's law per se. You know, some of them are very far from Moore's law. The RAM prices are, are improving exponentially. Magnetic disk storage is improving exponentially. You know, we used, used to have to pay I don't know, I, once in the 80s, I paid like $1,600 for a 40 megabyte drive. No kidding, 40 megabytes. Not gigabytes, megabytes. And nowadays, of course, nobody even makes anything less than a 100 gig or 500 gig drive. It's, hard, it's even hard to find, and those cost just a few bucks. So uh, incredible improvements, in, in, in including internet data speeds have improved. I just got fiber optic to my house, one gigabit to, to my house. Uh, I remember using it, I don't know, 50 kilobit modem, kilobits, not megabits, not gigabit, kilobits. You know, I remember using modems so slow in the 80s that you can read faster than the characters would appear on your screen. You could outpace them in your reading speed, actually. And that was, and that was still pretty good. We were happy about that, because at least we can communicate to other computers outside our own homes. Anyway, now you got gigabit or more to the house. Uh, so again, more. Moore's law in all sorts of domains, not just transistor counts. Supercomputing power increases, again, exponentially. And uh, this shows milestones in, in, in human evolution, right? So we, we're talking about you know, life on Earth starting here at about a billion years ago. And then uh, now this, this time scale is exponential. So we have more and more interesting milestones as evolution and time passes, right? So you got you know emergence of uh, humans somewhere around here, and then emergence of electricity use widespread, and finally computers. And here we are right now, and it keeps it keeps growing exponentially. Um, some of you probably remember times before Facebook, right? That was only ten years ago. Right? Uh, how did we communicate? How do we post things? How do we share photos and videos? I don't know. We 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 manage somehow. Uh, and Facebook also has some dark sides to it, but that's just an example of an explosion of technology in just the last few years, you know, social media. You know, so that shows you the, 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 this, this things on these curve here. And then uh, uh, growth in you know, you know, genomes sequence, again, exponential growth in, in, in genomic data available, and even in US patents granted, or just general patents, there's a very large explosion in, in, in granted patents. Uh, what's this dip here? What would you think if there's a big dip in patent issuance? What would you guess causes that? A world war. <laughs> yeah, but close enough. Um, so you can sort of tell where World War was just from looking at the dip. That's the whole point. You don't have to know the year. 
that dip will be where the war was. You know, whenever there's great consternation, it takes huge setbacks. So, um, so bottom line is um, Kurzweil talks about the singularity as the great convergence of technology and humanity. Uh, so humans uh, and technology are converging. There's already people with augmented bodies. There's humans with you know, pacemakers in their hearts or chips in their brains preventing um, uh, seizures, for example, or pacemakers preventing their heart from stopping. A pacemaker is no small feat of technology. It, it runs a full operating system. You can run Linux, tens of thousands of lines of code, you know, multi-threaded, Wi-Fi enabled, the Bluetooth connected to the outside, and, and that keeps your heart beating. You know, it's, a full, it's a full piece of technology, fully you know, general and, and programmable and so on. Um, and some people now have chips in their heads that are connected to their optic nerve, to their retinas, that allow them to see where before they were blind. How many, how many heard about that kind of stuff? Or allow them to hear before they were deaf. And so computers now are integrated into our bodies. You have chips inside and with power sources and, and batteries or you know, whatever the technology is. And so Kurzweil is saying there'll be more and more of that, and technology will keep merging with us until there'll be not a whole lot of difference between humans and the technology that humans use. We'll, we'll be sort of mm, integrated together. Uh, and it's not hard to believe that because you know, it's already happening. Uh, Google Glass had glasses where the glass was a computer and it can project stuff onto the visual field that you're looking at. How many heard of Google Glass just a few years ago? They stopped selling it, but they're just because they're working on something better and you know, they kind of pulled back a little bit. It wasn't quite ready for mass consumption market, but it's getting there. You know, so uh, if computer could get from a warehouse you know, to your desk, to your pocket, to your glass, and then into your brain, you know, th that's a very natural progression. They're getting smaller and smaller, better and better. You know, soon there'll be no difference between your brain and your brain on computer. You know, the, it, why not have a computer in your, in your brain that allows you to, say, look up web pages of stuff as you're talking to somebody? It'll come really, really handy in interviews or on final exams, I suppose. Uh, but you know, there's 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 this great convergence, and Ray Kurzweil is saying, you know, before before long, it'll be indistinguishable. So so. That will be sort of the next step in evolution, um, except it'll happen a lot quicker than the time it took us to get from dinosaurs to mammals, or from mammals to, to Neanderthals, or from Neanderthals to humans. Um, you know, the next step you know, won't take hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. It'll just be a few decades from now. Um, and he may be right. There's already a lot of signs that, that point in that direction. You know, so a lot of time elapsed you know, for physics and chemistry to take hold. and you know, supernova to create the elements and stars and galaxies to form and you know, planets to coalesce. And then, you know, biology took over uh, the surfaces of these planets and created self-replicating polymers called DNA. And now we got life and brains evolved from that. And now brains create technology. And then the next step will be the merger of that technology with the natural, naturally occurring <laughs> organisms that are already there. And then they'll kind of go off into the universe via space travel and probes and may, el may, may occur simultaneously es elsewhere, or may have already occurred elsewhere, for that matter. And then the universe will become kind of self-aware. A lot of the universe will become self-organizing, self-aware you know, entities like, like we are. But it'll happen at the macroscopic level, not this microscopic level and a little piece of dust here called Earth. Uh, so that's, that's, that's his theory. Now, it's, 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 a, it's a hypothesis. Uh, it may not happen you know, in that dramatic of a way. It may be more gradual and more gentle. Uh, but there's a lot of people that are exploring this kind of uh, you know, type scenarios. It's, it's, it's hard to predict things, you know, especially about the future. Right? But uh, that's, that's sort of what it is. Any, any questions about any of this, by the way, or comments? Or, uh, so that's what, uh, that's what the singularity is. OK. Uh, and of course, there's people who warn about that. We already mentioned Grey Goo and uh, kind of movies where things run amok. Uh, there's, there's some dangers, some uh, caveats. We have to be careful. Uh, you know, anything that's autonomous and self-reproducing can also you know, go haywire. If things go wrong, things may go wrong very, very badly, not just a little bit. Um, and uh, there's entire summits on it. There's the Singularity University, the Singularity conferences every year. People get together and talk about these things. It's a very clever people, smart people, accomplished people involved in these things. It's not just some fringe, uh, you know, fringe uh, you know, people. Uh, Stephen Wolfram is involved in it. Uh, Peter Thiel, who 
uh, helped co-found PayPal and even Facebook. Um, he's, a, he's a proponent of this and he investigates this and others. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, for more reading, I give a lot of links here about uh, robotics and singularities and aerial vehicles and laws of robotics and Asimov and science fiction and all that. So you can click on those for, for more information. Any, any thoughts, comments? Um, so um, in this course, we, we covered a lot of ground. Right? We started with Aristotle, if you remember, with the Greeks and uh, how we got here from abacus to iPhones over a 2,300 year period with a lot of milestones in between. And uh, one thing we really focus on is the Chomsky hierarchy. That it covers a lot of ground. We talked about complexity of computations, how hard or easy it is to compute and recognize certain languages and uh, compute certain algorithms. And uh, so this diagram summarizes a lot of the course, actually. As now you'll be able to talk, hopefully, very uh, at great length about each one of these regions and uh, its properties and inclusions and containments of other regions. And, and we proved literally dozens, probably hundreds of theorems are along the way about these things. So I made a list of all the things that we covered. This is, not, this is just a partial list. I couldn't list them all. There were too many. But I listed as many as I can think of uh, when I sat down to write this slide. And I, and I alphabetized it. So I'm, I'm highlighting a few things in red. You know, like the axiomatic method, right? Cardinality arguments, countable, uncountable. Chomsky hierarchy, we just showed that. That was a major one. The church during thesis, we talked about that. Boolean functions, that came up in exams, even. <coughs> Algorithms and, uh, you know, certain problems, complementing languages, composing things with other things. Concatenation as an operator and its effects on languages and strings. <coughs> Cook's theorem about NP completeness. Again, we're, we're up to over 100 things, and we're only up to D here in the alphabet. So there's a lot of stuff we went over in this course, just to, get, to give you an appreciation how much ground we cover, how much stuff we, we, we talked about and contemplated and, and discussed, and um, dovetailing, diagonalization. You got a lot of mileage out of those, as promised. Um, and uh, lots of counterexamples in terms of proofs. Decision versus optimization, that came up a lot. and will come up again, hint, hint. Uh, De Morgan's Law, Decidability. You know, time and space classes, you know, proving things more elegantly rather than collegially. Uh, don't use induction if you don't have to. Finite automata for Mann's last theorem. Uh, formal languages, major topic in this course. Gödel's theorem of incompleteness. Talking about grammars, context free, context sensitive grammars. So we're almost up to 200, we're, we're, we're G. Uh, existence proofs, right? Conway's game of life. Uh, graph colorability, we talked a lot about graph isomorphism. The halting problem, right, it's undecidable. We talked a lot about that. Uh, Hilbert's 10th problem, infinite hotels, kind of a touchstone about cardinality arguments. Uh, incompleteness, uh, you know, clean closures, lexicographic orders, enhancing machines, what happens or doesn't happen when you enhance certain machines certain ways. Right, we talked about reductions. Um, you know, we talked about um, modeling Turing machines and entry completeness. Occam's razor, simpler is better. Very, very important concept, permeates everything we, we did in the course, really. Talked about open problems and oracles. We talked about non determinism a lot. So you know, there's a lot of stuff we covered here. We're up to P and we're at 300. Polly is how to solve it. Most of you have read that. That's a that, that's very, very helpful book. Pigeonhole principle that came in very handy many times in proofs and arguments. Uh, Dovetailing simulations, P versus NP, polynomial time, power set constructions, right? Polynomial space. Uh, we talked about real numbers and rational numbers and their cardinalities and properties of them. And we talked about resource bound computations. The space is reusable, time isn't. We talked about Rice's theorem, almost every property of languages is undecidable. Robustness, robustness of P and NP, complexity classes, satisfiability that came up a lot and will come up again, another hint. Um, we talk about the scientific method, um, talk about regular languages, a lot of stuff here. Um, Self-reproduction, talk about simulation of things by other things, talk about minimizing states, super states, like in power set constructions, time and space hierarchies, talk about triangle inequality, that came a lot in proofs. I mean, I was amazed how long this list is. I, I, even I, I knew it's a lot, but I didn't expect that many. Right? Uh, and I'm just highlighting in, in red the kind of a few touchstones. 
We also talked about all the things that are not in red here, it's in, in, in dark ink, but I'm just kind of highlighting a few. The Turing tests, we just talked about that, actually, today and last time. Turing recognizable versus Turing decidable. Turing degrees, uncomputability. Uh, we talked about uncompressibility and uncompressible numbers. We talked about zero-knowledge proofs. Um, so we're, we're covering a lot of ground here. Um, so uh, back to Occam's razor, you know, Einstein said make everything as simple as you can, but not simpler. Again, that permeates, you know, the whole course, trying to simplify things rather than making them complicated, unnecessarily complicated, create simpler models, make interesting observations, you know, do it with efficiency, with eloquence, you know, do it with uh, uh, finesse, if you can. Uh, it's not always possible, but... That's something you should all strive for, not just in computer science, but in everything else we do in life. You know, Occam's razor is a very basic design principle. All right, so with, uh, with that, uh, that about uh, brings us to what I wanted to talk about formally. I promised an Ask Me Anything session. And we have another 20 plus minutes or so to, uh, to do that. So if you want to ask me uh, anything, we open the floor to, to arbitrary questions. So with some trepidation, I'll take arbitrary questions. Yeah. Okay, good question. He says, if I could solve one problem in my life and uh, have it be something arbitrary, uh, and I was assured it would succeed, um, I, would, I would probably go for polynomial time uh, algorithm for some NP-complete problem. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which because they're all interchangeable, right? So if you can, if you can, if you can prove P is equal to NP, and not just prove it because you might be able to prove it as an existence proof, but not, still not have an actual algorithm for, for SAT that's polynomial time that you can point to and actually run. You can just prove it, just like you could prove this infinity of primes, but that doesn't necessarily give you a prime bigger than a Googleplex. You know? But if you can come up with a fast algorithm for SAT, that will solve thousands and thousands of other problems, including protein folding, for example. And protein folding is a major problem that needs to be solved to cure cancer, actual cancer. So, so if, you can, if you could have a fast algorithm for SAT, you'll be curing cancer, among many other things. Um, so that'll be a monumental meta-achievement, because you know, cause most problems that we're trying to solve every single day are NP-complete, including how to, solve, how to cure cancer via certain biological problems like protein folding. So that would be amazing. Uh, so so that, would be, that would be a great achievement, I think. Um, and now, and now, if I can solve another problem, how to make everybody on Earth much more rational I don't know how to do that. Well, I sort of know how to do that. It's called education. Uh, but, 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 but implementing that solution takes two or three generations. Uh, and we're working on that. And in fact, here I am now working on this problem by trying to enlighten you about things. Uh, hopefully, you'll pay it forward and do the same for other people. And uh, maybe in 50 or 100 years, most of us will be highly rational. And so there will be less violence and wars and discrimination. All these things come from irrationality. Uh, you know what? I'll, 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 I'll prioritize that before the P is equal to NP solution. That's because that, that will solve a lot of other problems like wars. Wars are worse than cancer. Uh, and by wars, I, just don't, I don't just mean world wars. I mean all the bickering that happens at every level of life, all these levels of aggression that eventually escalate to a hostile, full-out war, but it doesn't start with the war. It starts with individuals being nasty to one another, you know, not being able to control their impulses and so on, and not thinking very rationally. And um, you know, violence had had its place evolutionarily. I mean, it, it, there, there's a reason why there's so much violence in the world. You know, evolutionarily, millions of years ago, when we were walking on the ground with our knuckles brushing on the ground, you know, living in caves, aggression had survival value. If you were aggressive and hostile, you can protect yourself and your brood from saber-toothed tigers and other threats that came along, and you had an edge. Nowadays, there's no more saber-toothed tigers, and you know, the world's a lot more gentle, but our aggressive urges are still with us. They're hardwired into our DNA. But on the bright side, we have cognition, and we have language, and we have philosophy and psychology, and we have science, and we can reason about these things. We don't necessarily have to be aggressive anymore, even though it's hard to shake this biological tendency that 
cause us to survive to this day. If we, didn't, if we weren't aggressive, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. It would be lunch to some you know, carnivores you know, thousands of years ago. Uh, so, so it's an interesting problem to have. You know, the fact that we're even here means we're naturally aggressive. But now it's a dysfunction. It's no longer an advantage. But we still can't get rid of it. So if I can solve a problem, you know, another problem, you know, how do we get rid of this aggression? It's even imbued in our sports. Our sports are aggressive. You know, boxing is two people bashing each other's faces you know, for two hours and everybody's cheering. You know, it's, 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 it's not, it's, that's not a sport. It's, it's a street fight that people pay to watch. You know, the Romans had a more interesting idea. You know, they gave him swords. And they said, you know, if you're going to do this, let's not be wishy about it. So I, I'm not saying we should bring back gladi 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 gladiators. I'm not saying that. I'm saying at least they weren't hypocritical about what was it was about. You know, we're kind of hypocritical about it. So we have a problem on top of another problem. We have aggression that's a problem. And then we try to, to mask it off as something else, and that's a problem yet on top of the first. You know, it's, so there's a bit of this self-deception on top of the aggression that we already have. Anyway, don't get me started, but uh, what else? Yeah. When you talk about impulses, what do you think about virtual versus one-minute fights? Uh, which fight? One-minute fight. Oh, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with that. Is that Yeah, so you mean like intellectual arguments uh, as opposed to physical bouts? Yeah, I mean, you wrote in the middle of World War I, so you pretty... Yeah. Yeah, so, so Russell w was a pacifist, and, um, you know, he, he tried his best to convince the world that, you know, somehow we should get, you know, more Gentile and, and pacifist and get rid of wars, and uh, not very successfully. Einstein tried the same, you know, many times, and uh, very smart people... Uh, argued against aggression, but it's, it's not enough. It's, it's, it's kind of hardwired into us. Uh, the fact that we even kill animals, you know, if you think about, you know, hunting, you know, if somebody hunts and eats it and so on and, and is not squeamish about cutting it up and cooking it, I can respect that. But if somebody just hunts just for the heck of it, to me that doesn't seem fair. You know, it's, it's not a sport, it's slaughter. Uh, the animal doesn't have a chance. Right? It's like, you know, if a professional basketball player played against a toddler and beat the toddler 300 to, one, 300 to zero in basketball, that wouldn't be sport. It would just be ridiculous, right? Uh, so, I don't know. If, if, you know if, if a hunter wants to take a, a knife and go up against a grizzly bear, you know, I, I, you know, I can see us paying pay, you know, pay-per-view to watch that because it, I can go either way, actually. <laughs> uh, that would be much more fair and interesting, you know. Uh, to watch than just somebody shooting a poor deer from 300 yards with a you know, telescopic uh, uh, sight rifle. And I, that's, that's not particularly fair or interesting. And the outcome is very predictable. And, uh, so, but that's just an, another outlet to our aggressive tendencies, you know, that we disguise as other things. We call it sport. It's not sport. Um, something darker than that. Uh, so, you know, we, we, should, we, should, we should acknowledge that. We shouldn't uh, deny it. So, so denial, you know, they say denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Uh, denial. Uh, denial is not great. Uh, even if it's something that we don't like about ourselves, first let's acknowledge that, admit that, and then try to fix that. As opposed to argue for it and then deny it and then pretend it's not there. Now we got two problems. We got the original problem plus denial on top of that. And, but that's what humans tend to do. You know, that's what we do. Uh, so that's not great. So again, if I could solve some problem, you know, that would be one of the things at the top of my list, to try to get people to see through these things and think about them rationally and logically, and hopefully the world will be a better place. What else? Yeah. Uh, when do I learn to dance? Oh, when, where did I learn to dance, or how did I learn? Uh, my brother tried to drag me to dancing for many years, and uh, I always kind of blew him off and said, yeah, 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 whatever. And finally, he managed to drag me. And I thought it was great. I started taking lessons. I practiced. It's wonderful. It's, uh, you can go anywhere in the world and, and dance beautifully with people, not even speak their language. So it's kind of a universal communication. It's, it's musical, it's, it's expressive, it's, it's, uh, it's a sport, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, medit it's meditative. You know, you go, you go into this like trans, trans, you know, kind of a trans uh, state of mind where it's almost like meditation, it flows, it's, it's very nice. So it just stuck ever since and I still do it. It's wonderful. I've danced all over the world and highly recommend it. Uh, 
How many are into the ballroom dancing or salsa dancing around? There's, there's clubs around campus that teach ballroom and salsa. Go look it up. It's, uh, it's free, and uh, it's a lot of fun. What else? Yeah. Favorite thing on the reading list? Uh, there's a lot of stuff, um, but you know, if there's one book I, I think will be very helpful is uh, Carl Sagan's uh, uh, Demon Hunted World, because that addresses a lot of the issues that we talked about earlier, you know, uh, rationality and logic, and uh, so you know, reading that could prevent a lot of other issues. Um, but Paul is how to solve it is pretty good. Uh, but you know, a lot of those things on the list are, are really good and useful and impressive and eye-opening. That's why I put them on the list for you to, to read, my gift to you. Uh, question. What's your opinion of organized religion? What's my opinion of organized religion? Um, so first, you know, with, without, without, you know I, I don't want to offend anybody, but um, again, humans tend to uh, invent stuff. So if we don't know something, instead of admitting that we don't know, what we tend to do is make stuff up. We're much more comfortable with, with making stuff up, even if we're not sure what's going on, than admitting that we don't know something. So, so that's not a great tendency. Um, and you know, for people who said, you know, how can anybody you know, not believe in some deity? Think about it. There's about 1,000 deities right now that people believe in on the planet Earth right now currently. There's about 1,000 different deities. And even if you believe in one, you're atheist about the other 999 of them. So even if you're a believer in some organized religion right now, and I'm not saying anything to demean anybody, you're 99.9% .9 atheist as you stand about everybody else's deity. So some people just go one deity further than the 999 that you all go for already. So you can't really blame them for doing that, right? And by the way, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Richard Dawking. He said that. I heard him say that in person. He gave a talk here a few years ago. And that's a very interesting observation. You know, so we're all atheists. Some of them might just go beyond the 99.9% .9 that, that the rest of us are and go to 100 and kind of round it up a little bit. That's the only difference. Uh, but, you know, seriously, uh, it's good to question things. You know, if you want to believe things, that's fine, but it's also healthy to question things and ask why, and who said it, and what, what self-interest they have, and you know, how it evolved, and what good does it do, and what harm does it do. Everything has good and harm in it. Religion did a lot of good. It also did a lot of harm. There were inquisitions, and crusades, and holy wars, and there still are, and ethnic cleansings, and they're all religious-based. Uh, but it's also, you know, also prevented a lot of deaths. You know, thou shalt not kill, and a lot of people do that simply because it's on the list of the 10 things you, you should do or shouldn't do. But I think you can do these things or not do these things, not because they're on some list, because it, they make sense, right? You know, killing is, is, it doesn't feel right, doesn't sound right, that doesn't, you know, f you know think right, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's presumptuous, it's, it's not good. And, it, and you can go around and not kill, not because you're afraid of going to hell or trying to go to heaven, but because it's the right thing to do, to not kill. You know, it could be as simple as that. We don't need a lot of brand, branding and marketing around that to do that, you know. Again, I'm not demeaning any, anybody. I'm not putting any, any, any system down. I'm just saying uh, there's, there's other ways to, to do the right things besides some, some, some person telling you what's okay and what's not okay. So anyway, uh, we have to finish, but, uh, you know, it's, it's been fun. And, you know, with that, I'll just stop. <laughs>